Hi, welcome to Mrs. Lee's Chemistry Academy, where no students are left behind. Today, we're going to talk about mass spectrometry. This is related to learning objective from the College Board 1.2. The students are able to use data from the mass spectrometry to identify the elements and the masses of individual atoms of a specific element. So how does a mass spectrometer work? Here is a diagram that shows first the sample is vaporized into gaseous form and injected into the instrument. Then being bombarded with high energy electron beams that would knock off the valence electron from the atoms to turn them into positive ions. These ions then are accelerated through the electrical field and bent by the magnetic field. Now the bending depends on the mass and the charge of the ions. Basically, the lighter the mass, the greater the charge, the greater is the bending. And the deflection is recorded on the recorder as peak intensity and atomic mass unit. Let's refresh ourselves on what is an isotope. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons meaning same atomic numbers, but different number of neutrons, meaning different mass numbers. For example, let's compare carbon-12 with carbon-14. They are isotopes of carbon. Now they have the same number of protons being number six, but carbon-12 has six neutrons and carbon-14 has eight neutrons, and that's the difference. Let's try to solve problem number one. Here we have 75.5% chlorine-35 and 24.5% chlorine-37, the two naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine with different atomic mass unit. Let's to try to calculate the average atomic mass of chlorine. The way to do it is to take the atomic mass unit of each isotope, multiply by the percent abundance, and add it up together, now we have obtained 35.45 atomic mass unit being the weighted average. And here's the spectrum of chlorine. The left one peak being taller, representing chlorine 35 with 75.5% relative abundance, and the right peak representing chlorine 37 with 24.5% relative abundance. Now let's try problem number two. Gallium has two naturally occurring isotopes, one being gallium-69 and the other being gallium-71. If we know their individual atomic mass unit and the weighted average being 59.72 AMU, we can then calculate the relative abundance of each isotope, and here's the way to do it. First, let X be the percentage of gallium-69 and therefore gallium-71 must be 1 minus x. Now let's multiply the relative percent abundance by the individual atomic mass unit and add it up together, we obtain 69.72 AMU being the weighted average. Calculating for that, x is 60.3% of gallium-69 and 1 minus x is 39.7% of gallium-71. Now, we are then asked to pick the spectrum out of the four following spectra of which one would correlate to our calculations. Upon careful examination, I would pick spectrum A because it has a taller peak on the left, representing gallium-69, and a smaller, shorter peak on the right, representing gallium-71. I hope you would agree with me. The final problem deals with a spectrum with four lines, four peaks, the yellow, the blue, the red, and the green. We are asked to calculate the average atomic mass using this mass data and then identify the unknown element. So we take the peak height of each peak, uh, which is recorded as 0 0.2, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19,
2.2 and 5.2 units on the y-axis, respectively, and multiplied it by the atomic mass unit of 204, 206, 207, 208, respectively, we arrive at 207.2 AMU. Mm -hmm. I hope by now you would know what the element is if you check with your periodic table. Sure enough, it's lag 207. So to sum up what we have learned today in our lesson, one, we have explored what is a mass spectrometer and how it works to separate isotopes by their relative masses. Two, we take uh, a mass spectrum and extract data from it so that we can extract relative percent abundance and also the atomic mass unit of each peak which represents the isotope. And then we can calculate the average atomic mass unit of that atom or of that element and then we can use it to identify the unknown. I hope that you have found the above lesson helpful and I hope to see you again next time. And by the way, we welcome any comments from you in the box below. Any comment will be very helpful to us. Thank you.